Well, good morning again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome home. Uh, those of you here last week, or if you've caught up on our, our YouTube sermons, you know that we began a, a new series uh, that's basically a journey into the subject of communion. We started with a very academic overview of what, what communion is, including its various names, such as the Eucharist, Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, um, the Last Supper, you know, all the, all the different names. And uh, last week I talked about communion's connection to things like sacrament, rite, and ritual, and its link to Passover. Today we'll build on those definitions while we delve more into the why of communion. Let us pray. Divine love, Abba, Creator God, however we see you. Thank you for human representations of spiritual things that we can't really define. Speak to us as you always do through your Holy Spirit and let whatever resonates with us today in this message grow and blossom and, and bear fruit and let whatever doesn't resonate with us just sit for a later time or for whoever else needs it. Thank you for the privilege of being here today. Thank you for the love that you surround us with through others. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, as promised, we're going to get into the why. And this is, in, and of course, it's very individual, but, the, but there are some intersections, I believe, that we can kind of connect to. A big part of the why is based on the model that we talked about last week of the Last Supper in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But it also involves teachings from that other Gospel, the Gospel of John. In John chapter 6, starting in verse 32, again using the Common English Bible today, uh, it says, Jesus told them, I assure you, it wasn't Moses who gave the bread from heaven to you. But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. The bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said, sir, give us this bread all the time. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. So even John talks about the concept that that we now appreciate as communion. From here it kind of shifts into, as we get into the whys, there are really, and again, this is a broad overview, so every, everyone also has their own individual perceptions or, or angles or approaches. But there are two overall schools of thought that, that kind of carry the what into the why. One school of thought is labeled transubstantiation. This, very loosely, is the idea that the bread and wine of communion become, actually become, the very presence of Jesus through the ritual of the blessing of the elements and the receiving of the elements with that intent. This is most often associated with the Roman Catholic Church and other similar high liturgy followers, but mostly Roman Catholic. And among the supports for this doctrinal tenet the followers tend to cite the same chapter of John. Earlier I quoted uh, John 6, 32 through 35. <laughs> Later in the same chapter, and again, this is when Jesus is, I think he had already walked on water, he had fed thousands of people, he had done all these miracles, and then people were like, but, but, you claim to be the Son of God. People were trying to kill him because he was, in their view, claiming all these things that were heresy and blasphemy and everything else. And so the, he's kind of arguing with some of the religious zealots of the time. And so they're trying to trap him in certain things. But then also he's talking to, to both his, his, his core disciples and like the greater people. So it, it's kind of a mix of crowds here. 
But later in the same chapter of John, it says, Jesus said to them, I assure you, unless you eat the flesh of the human one and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. My flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. So the idea is that it's a process, and we have to continue to do that. I heard it explained recently, and, and this has helped me grasp it a little better. Um, it's not that the materials or the recipe changes. I mean, I still have the taste of the communion wafer in my mouth. It didn't, like... There's no white meat, dark meat, you know. <laughs> it's not It's not of that. The material, it's not transmaterialization. The recipe is the same. The ingredients are the same. What changes is the presence. That's what's meant, what is meant by the substance. What changes is through the grace of God, which if you remember last week, that's what makes it a sacrament, the application of God's grace. It becomes the physical manifestation, so to speak, of Christ's presence. And so it, it's kind of like the function of Christ on earth translating to us. That's what allows us, in the transubstantiation school of thought, that's what allows us to continue Christ's work. That's what allows us that connection to the Holy Spirit. Even if you don't follow that belief, that explanation may help get beyond the idea of, you know, that it's some sort of vampire thing or cannibalism or, you know, something like that and get you to this idea of a holy mystery and another indicator of God's grace. That's what's helped me. I don't, I, I'm not a transubstantialist, transubstantialist, I, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm not one, but just through my own research, I've been able to go, okay, I can find that intersection like we talk so much about. And be like, oh, it is the spiritual aspect, but it, it's just a more physical representation of it than the way I take it. And so that, you know, that's okay. But I also wanted to provide an overview because, again, we like to reach out. Um, on the other hand, many Protestants view communion somewhere along a wider scale. They range from a similar spiritual transformation of the food and drink. A lot of Lutherans follow the, the idea that it's not quite transubstantiation, but it's pretty close. It's like Jesus' presence is still through communion. Um, and then it, it goes all the way to others that are just like, it's a completely symbolic act. It's just a, a sign of remembrance. Um, and it, it's something reflected every meal, things like that. None of those are wrong. All of that is fine. It, again, it's your spiritual journey. It's what works for you. The backers of communion being kind of spiritually symbolic in nature and less about transubstantiation, they cite another verse from the still the same chapter of John. In, in verse 63, Jesus says, The Spirit is the one who gives life, and the flesh doesn't help at all. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And that's kind of their hinge pin of, hey, this is spirit. Their flesh is nothing. So regardless of where we fall on that concept or school of thought, the why of communion still surrounds Christ. The ritual first um, and, and this list isn't necessarily in order of importance, uh, but the ritual is a commemoration. I think we can all agree on that. Through communion, we honor Jesus as the Lamb of God. And remember, this was introduced at a time when lambs had to be slaughtered for Passover. You know, there was a very real application here. So by Jesus saying, no, I'm the Lamb of God, it shifts us from that need to sacrifice. It removes our need for blood atonement. And if you followed my messages at all before, 
you'll know that, that my view on that is that the need for sacrificial blood was one we created to deal with our own shortcomings. It wasn't that God demanded it of Jesus. We demanded it of God, basically. Because we just couldn't get by with the idea that forgiveness could be anything that we didn't earn. And God's like, here, I'll show you. I love you so much that I'll die for you. If you must have blood, take mine. Um, and I won't get any deeper into that right now because that's, you know, that's a whole other thing. And I want to focus on communion. But it's also a nod to Jewish history because it honors Jesus as the completion of the Passover event. The Last Supper was at Passover, as I spoke last week. And it's a reminder of the manna provided during the Exodus. Those, those, the things Jesus was saying connected to the manna from heaven that during the Exodus they weren't able to collect the bread and you could only collect enough for that one day. And that's why communion is kind of a continual process. Um, and that's one reason I like to do it every week too. But you don't have to. Uh, remember, what, much of what we do learn and believe grows from previous actions, knowledge, and thoughts. It's okay to have a springboard, to have a foundation. We're not trying to reinvent spirituality. The establishment of communion is no different in that regard. It's a growth of previous belief. The right goes just, it, it, the right goes beyond commemorating Christ though. Because it connects us directly to God. Whether transubstantiation or symbolism or anything in between, we are dining with Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're connecting Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Whether Trinitarian, Unitarian, however <laughs> you take that too. We're connecting it all. And we signify our own inclusion and acceptance into God's fold when we choose to partake. And we do this in remembrance of Christ and of Christ's message. So, so communion is a commemoration. Communion is a connection directly to God. And communion builds community. Like other meals we share, the Lord's Supper offers a way to appreciate our diverse lives, viewpoints, and backgrounds, and also allows us to pause and share something in common. It doesn't matter how we see the bread and wine, or grape juice, or whatever it is we use. It, it, it's okay, it doesn't matter. You're allowed to see it however you choose to see it, and whatever works with you. We still can do it together. And that's yet another way we can reflect our own unique angles of God's light and love. But like other aspects of connection to God and community and even commemoration, it's not a requirement. God doesn't require us to do that. It's just, it's yet another tool in our toolbox. It's, it's another form of worship. It's, it's, it's music from the inside out. And that's why if you don't, if, if none of this vibes with you at all, that's fine too. But if you were kind of wondering or, you know, kind of like, I don't, I don't get this part, but I kind of like this part, then, then maybe that gives you another why to, to give it a shot, if you choose to. Again, I won't tell God on you. <laughs> and next week, we're going to, you know, I, I, I touched on transubstantiation. That's a kind of a difficult thing to touch on sometimes. Last week, I talked about the difference between rite, ritual, and sacrament, and all that. So, that, so that's why I'm doing it in little chunks, because it's a lot to process. Um, and then I try to do something academic and connected to spiritual. So that's where I'm going with this. Next week, I'm going to talk about the whole idea in uh, Paul's letters, or Paul's specifically one letter to the Corinthians about partaking in an unworthy manner. 
So, I think I've got, I think God's given me some kind of cool insight in that. So we'll see. But uh, that, that's what we'll do next week. For now, just reflect on, on what communion does or doesn't mean to you and how you choose to do it. Whether it's here, whether, whether it's just a commemoration by praying over a meal. Because that connects too. Yeah. Let us pray.